The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes had so much hype around its release because we haven't gotten a new Hunger Games book in 10 years. Suzanne Collins returned with a prequel novel that takes place 65 years before the original three books, and it focused entirely on Coriolanus Snow, the president during the original trilogy. I'm a little late to make this video because I honestly wasn't planning to make a review or video essay on the book, but I've gotten tweeted at, DM'd, and gotten at least 100 comments asking me to give my thoughts on the novel, because Hunger Games is obviously one of the main series I focus on in this channel, so I thought why not, I might as well. I already made a video on Snow's life and timeline, but none of my opinions were in that video, it was mostly facts. So now I'm going to dig down deep and tell you what I thought of the new book. This will sort of be a breakdown of the novel as well as a review, and after going over everything that this book has to offer, at the end I'll answer the big question as to whether or not this book lives up to the hype. There are going to be major spoilers for this book, so if you have not read the novel, you have now been warned, because right away I'm going to give spoilers. Just to give a quick summary of the book, it focuses on Coriolanus Snow in his final year at the Academy, which is basically high school in the capital, and he and 23 other students are chosen to mentor tributes in the 10th Hunger Games because people were losing interest in the games and this was their way to spice things up. Snow falls in love with his tribute named Lucy Gray. She wins the games, but Snow is caught helping her cheat, so he's sent away to be a peacekeeper in District 12. There he spends more time with Lucy Gray, but their love story ends tragically as Snow kills her and he goes back to the capital to live his normal life. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's just a simple plot breakdown and all you'll need to know for this review if you have forgotten it or needed a refresher. For this book, Suzanne Collins carried over the same writing structure from the original trilogy, as it's split up into three parts, each part its own section of the story. Her actual way of writing is the same here as well, as it basically breaks things and ideas down for you inside the main character's head as the story unfolds, which is one of my favorite parts of the Hunger Games series and Collins' way of writing. Instead of being in Katniss's head, however, we're of course inside the head of her greatest enemy, Coriolanus Snow, which I found to be super interesting. Right off the bat, when it was announced that the novel would focus on Snow, I was pretty surprised and not really sure how to feel about it, but I think Collins actually did a great job flushing out his downfall. We see that Snow was actually a good person before he became a mentor for the games, and it makes his character arc rather tragic, and it actually made me feel badly for Snow, which is something I never thought possible after reading the original trilogy. While we thought that Snow or Al McQueen were the main villains in the Hunger Games, neither of them even come close to Dr. Gall who we met in this book. She's the person that pulls the string so elegantly, and she's the person who got into Snow's head and really made him turn out the way he did. I actually love Dr. Gall's character, because every scene that she's in is where Collins has her best writing in this book, as it not only went deeper into Snow's character, but the entire world of Pan Am and the Hunger Games series. Ironically, the parts that I found the most interesting in this book were the ones where nothing was really going on except a discussion in class with the mentors led by Dr. Gall, the teacher. They question what the Hunger Games really stands for, and they come to the conclusion that the Hunger Games is an eternal war, but it's a war that they can control. It puts a stop to the real war, like in the Dark Days, or later in the revolution with Katniss, because that war cannot be controlled. Collins expanded on the Hunger Games here, and the outcome is that it's not just a simple punishment for the districts rebelling, but it means so much more because it's a way to keep peace and a controlled outcome. Control is one of the main themes in this book, and it's one of the things that Snow craves, but he pushes it down, making him still be a good person. However, when Dr. Gall comes around, she finds this craving of control inside of him and brings it out, and this is what she based her whole manipulation of Snow on, and it's what she used to bring the dark side of Snow out. The gradual decline of Snow's morality is the main focus in this book, and it's very well written because it's a slow transition from him being moral to Snow becoming the man that we eventually know he will become. Gull starts by sending Snow into the arena where she knows Snow might have to be violent to survive, and when Snow actually kills a tribute in the arena to save himself, Gull gets in his head and says that it was his choice to kill that boy and no one else's, so he would have to live with that and eventually embrace murdering people. And he does just that. When he commits his second murder, shooting Mayfair in District 12, he does it not for self-defense, not to protect others, but simply to ensure that she didn't tell on him and ruin his plans to gain power. Because Gaul made him embrace murder, he saw it as the solution in that situation, something that is honestly terrifying. But the best part of this was when Collins gives us a look inside of Snow's head after the murder of Mayfair, and he thinks to himself that the second murder was a lot easier, proving even further how much he embraced murder. 
At the end of the book, we of course see him poison Dean Highbottom, and that was a very fitting scene for the last scene in the novel, because it leads right into how he poisoned too many people to count to rise to power and become president. Now while all of that was great, I do have some complaints about the overall story arc. The beginning was really good. I love Snow being a mentor and his relationship with Lucy Gray, which I'll talk more about in a minute. But once the Hunger Games end, I was not a fan of the rest of the story. Snow gets shipped off to be a peacekeeper for cheating in the games, and that whole sequence felt so rushed in my opinion, especially because the parts before this were written at a much slower pace. It's fine to have just a slow pace or just a fast paced book, but making the first two thirds slow and the final third fast paced just felt so odd. Also, the whole ending was a huge cop out. We find out that Dr. Gall let him be sent to District 12 as punishment, but had no intention of keeping him there as it was just one big test. So Snow wasn't even punished, just tested, and it made the whole situation sort of pointless. Then it gets even worse, because after Dr. Gall tells him that he's staying in the capital and going to university like the punishment never happened, she then says that she erased all footage from that year's Hunger Games, and she was making sure that everybody would forget about the student mentors, and most importantly, Lucy Gray. So basically, the world forgot about the games, making the whole first half of the book pointless, and Snow's whole experience as a peacekeeper is wiped away because he just comes back to his original capital life. It's almost the equivalent of saying the main character woke up and everything was just a dream. That being said, it's not all pointless. I'm being a little bit dramatic. There were some parts of the novel that stuck, like the games changing the way they worked, and obviously how both Dr. Gall and Lucy Gray changed Snow's life and sent them down a different and much darker path. I tried writing this review without mentioning the other three books, but obviously right off the bat I did just that, and I realized it's inevitable. You can't look at this prequel without comparing it to the original trilogy. And when doing that, I found that the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes did not give me the same thrill while reading it that the other books did. I honestly found it to be quite boring in some places, and it was honestly hard to keep reading at some points. The actual Hunger Games were quite boring, especially because a huge chunk of the tributes were killed off before the games even started, and all they did in the arena was just hide. It's obviously not meant to be as thrilling as the other Hunger Games, because in those, they had elaborate arenas with things like clocks, giant monkeys, bloody rain, shooting fireballs at tributes, and so much more, while this one was just in an oval arena. I realize that this main focus isn't the Hunger Games, but rather Snow's character development, but I just found those parts hard to get through. Though the story focuses on Snow, Lucy Gray carries the story and is by far the most intriguing character in the novel. As I said, there's of course a love story like the other books, and it's amidst a dystopian future and a war-riddled world with a messed up class system. This love story is much more like Romeo and Juliet, two people from very different worlds who want to be together, and it's quite a fascinating relationship. Lucy Gray is the bridge that carried this book to the original trilogy more than anything else, because she's obviously from District 12 just like Katniss. When going to District 12, we see so many things, like the lake house that Katniss' father showed her when she was young, and that house actually plays a huge part in this book, as you know if you've read it. We also see the Hob in District 12, 64 years before we see it in the first novel, and see Lucy Gray and the Covey perform there. And of course, the thing that bridges this book to the original trilogy more than anything are the songs that the Kobe sing, including the song that Katniss sang to Rue when she died, and my favorite, the Hanging Tree song, which we find out that Lucy Gray actually wrote herself. In this novel, we get a glimpse as to where and what this song was actually about, though when looking at it, there are actually several ways in which this song can be interpreted. There's the man at the execution who cried out for his love to flee as she ran forward before he was executed, or as Snow later realized, it could be written from Billy Top, Lucy Gray's ex's perspective, singing it to Lucy Gray so they could meet at the hanging tree. But my favorite interpretation is how it actually tells the story of this novel. Strung up a man, Sejanus, who was executed, said who murdered three, what Snow let slip to Lucy Gray saying that he killed three people instead of the two that she knew about, which brought about her whole murder where I told you to run so we'd both be free, Snow and Lucy Gray running away from District 12 to be free. I just love the way Collins leaves everything so open, and everyone can interpret it differently. The same can be said about Lucy Gray's disappearance. Although I thought it was a bit of a cop-out for her to just be erased, there are so many possibilities for where she could have gone, or what could have happened to her. Collins is great at leaving fans talking, and fans come up with so many fan theories and just have fun interpreting her novels. 
While reading this, you constantly think, oh, this is in the past. Because compared to the original trilogy, it's about 65 years in the past, depending on which book you're looking at. But then you see things like advanced medicine or high-tech security cameras, and you realize, oh wait, this is still in the future. Because though this is the past when compared to the original trilogy, you have to remember, it's still the future from what we know, because this is America in the future. In this book, we get a few hints at this. First, how the reaping day is on July 4th, America's birthday. And even more, there's a scene where Snow looks out the window of the train, and he sees what he describes as dead cities that are now abandoned to their elements, and Snow wondered what they had been in their glory back when this had all been North America, not Pan Am. Though this part is small, I found this to be really interesting. There is so much world building in this novel, most of which adds a lot to the overall Hunger Games universe. We get to know more about capital life and how it works with the academy and university. We see the still pretty recent effects of the dark days and sort of see the districts as the bad guys in the war as they started it. They're the reason why Snow doesn't have a father. And we even find out that they cut the capital off from supplies for the final two years of the war, pretty much destroying the capital and making people go crazy enough to turn to cannibalism. We see Pan Am from a different point of view. And it happens to be the complete opposite of the original trilogy. We also find out more about Mocking Jays and Jabber Jays, and we meet the person who made Jabber Jays, which was really cool. We also see Snow's introduction to Mocking Jays and see how much he hates them, which eventually makes his hate for Katniss, who took on the persona of a Mocking Jay, mean so much more. Now I have to talk about the ending and Lucy Gray's supposed murder. I did not think this book would turn into The Shining. Here's Johnny! <laughs> we see Snow go after Lucy Gray, and one of my favorite lines was Snow saying how ironic it was that the relationship had turned into their own personal Hunger Games. Though I said that the final third of this book was my least favorite part, this was actually one of my favorite parts of the novel and the most thrilling. I could not put the book down. When I was reading it, I did not even know where I was because I was so entranced in the story. One thing I was worried about with this novel was the fact that they were making a movie based on this book, and they announced the release of the book and the movie at the same time, and I thought that this might change Colin's way of writing, writing it less like a novel and more like a screenplay, but I was very happy to see that this was not the case. In fact, I think they're going to have a harder time turning this into a movie than the original trilogy, because it's written in such a novel-focused writing style that adapting it to the big screen is going to be a real challenge. So the big question, did this book live up to the insane amount of hype that surrounded it? I personally think yes it did. It dragged on in some parts, and it might have been a cop out at the end, but overall it was a solid story and a solid read that added a lot to the overall Hunger Games universe. It's not one of those pointless add-on stories that are just added to make a few bucks from a successful franchise. You can tell that Collins put her all into this, and really wanted to write this, not for the money, but just solely out of her passion for the series. A lot of other franchises that have add-ons don't really have a significant impact on the original work, and you can tell that they're just add-ons for the sake of add-ons to make money. But the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes definitely had an impact on the franchise, most notably how we look at the character of Coriolanus Snow. Now when reading the original three books, I certainly will see Snow in a whole different light, and that's how you know a prequel or any add-on was written well. This book also had so much world building as I just mentioned, and it made the series much more complex and explored deeper meanings in the world that Collins created. Is it the best in the series? No, certainly not. Is it on par with the original three books? Again, no. But it's a solid story that I enjoyed to read, and it kept me entertained for the most part. I'm very glad that Collins decided to write this, and I'm glad that it adds so much to the overall Hunger Games series. I never thought that I would be able to read a new Hunger Games book, and I know that so many other people thought the same, so we had huge expectations for Collins, and I think for the most part, she came through. She did live up to the hype. Thank you so much for watching guys. You can follow me on social media to see more of my personal life and see more of this little dude. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook for Movie Flame updates. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured in the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, become a patron today. Again, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you press that like button and subscribe and look out for more great videos on the way.